Hi everybody, welcome back. We're in chapter 11 now, and this is dealing with vapor cycles, which are awesome, and I really wish that's what a jet ski was called. Like a vapor cycle? That sounds way cooler. Okay, enough of that though. Let's talk about the Carnot cycle. You're like, wait, Carnot cycle? Yes, it's here too. It's the most efficient cycle you can have, whether you have air as a working fluid or water as a working fluid, as we do in this case. So, just to remind you, it's a little bit different when we're doing a vapor cycle. First off, we have a boiler and we have a condenser. That is how we're adding heat and that is how we're removing heat. Beyond that, everything else is the same. We have isentropic expansion and isentropic compression. Now, it could look like one of these two things. The Carnot cycle is the same regardless. We're just putting it in different places. Um, for this little red line right here, if you've forgotten, that is your phase change line. We learned about that in chapter three. And so on this side, it's a liquid, and on this side, it's a vapor. So vapor, liquid. Now, the Carnot cycle, we couldn't use it with um, a regular air breathing cycle. So you're probably guessing that we can't use it here as well, and that's the truth, we can't. Now, it is the most efficient cycle. Like if we could do this, it would be the best thing in the world, but it just doesn't work. A couple reasons. First off, process one to two. Okay, so we have to limit our heat transfer. Because if we go beyond this, we start having a very, very different system. So when we're heating it from one to two, well, we have an issue that we're trying to stay inside of this phase change line. So that means our max temperature there could be about 374, for Celsius, or 374 degrees Celsius for water. Okay, from two to three. Turbines do not like steam that has a lot of water in it. Whether that is there, this one doesn't have a lot of water in it, that one would be fine. But we don't want to have a whole lot of water in it. Because if you do, it's going to cause it to rust, it's going to cause erosion and wear. It doesn't, it's not a very nice thing to do. Okay, and process four to one, that's the compressor. It's just not going to work because we can't handle more than one phase. So for all of those reasons, you're thinking, okay, well, let's just move it up. Because, you know, at this point, it's only handling one phase. It's a liquid, and that's okay. And right up here, it's only handling one phase. It's kind of superheated. As you note, know, when you go above this top line, things get really wonky really fast. Um, but the issue there is I'm going to immensely high pressures. Remember, as I go up there, I'm getting to higher and higher pressures. So cycle B is still not suitable because we have to do isentropic compression up to incredible pressures, and we just can't do that well. So how do we fix this? Well, we kick the Cardinal cycle to the curb. We don't really kick it to the curb and we use something called the Rankine cycle. Now this is the ideal cycle for vapor power cycles. And what we're doing here is we're trying to get rid of any of the impracticalities of the Carnot cycle while still, as best we can, making sure that we have a very efficient cycle. So let's walk through this real quick. Now, since it is ideal right here, one thing to remember is that we're saying it has no irreversibilities as we move through this chapter, though, what we're going to see is that there are irreversibilities, and we can correct for those. There we go. Back to it. Switch slides on me. So first off, four steps. We have isentropic compression in a pump. That's going right here where I'm a saturated liquid up to here. As a note, the difference between those two dots right here is greatly exaggerated. And I have a little bit of work going in, but it is truly a tiny amount of work. Then from two all the way to three, I'm adding heat in the boiler. So I'm going from a compressed liquid right here at two, all the way to a superheated vapor right here at three. I then have isentropic expansion from three to four. That happens in the turbine. That's where I get my workout. And as a note, what you can see here is that the turbine is dealing with superheated vapor for most of that. And even when it gets into the saturated mixture area, it is a very, very high quality. It's very, very close to one. It doesn't have to be one, but you know, you're know, you not gonna have like 50%. It's gonna be very, very close to one. And finally, constant pressure heat rejection in the condenser where I go from that mixture all the way back to a saturated liquid, um, repeating the cycle. So this is our ideal cycle. This is what we're gonna be dealing with. You're gonna see this shape a lot for this chapter. 
Now, we kind of done this in the past, so I'll go ahead and bring it up again. Thermal efficiency. Um, it's equal to the area under the top line on a TS diagram to the area enclosed within your cycle. So we want as much as possible to maximize that. Now, Carnot cycle is the best you can get for that. That's kind of what I drew right here. That's a Carnot cycle. Um, we're not as efficient as the Carnot cycle, but this is the ideal case for what we can actually build. And so just remember that. If you actually knew the exact shape of this diagram, you could find out the efficiency, the work output, all these different details just by looking at the areas. So our thermal efficiency comes back to this again. Our network over our heat input, that never changes for every single cycle. That is always true. Sometimes we have different equations that make it easier on us just based on how cycles run, but it works out pretty fine. Now, the last little thing I'm gonna give you here, which you'll probably need on a homework problem or two, is that often the efficiency of power plants is expressed in terms of the heat rate, which is simply how much heat is being supplied to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity. And so if that's the case, you can get your thermal efficiency by saying, okay, what is your heat rate? I'm gonna take 3,412 and divide it by my heat rate. Do you do that all that often? No, but just in case you do, here it is. Well, that's it for this time. Thank you for listening. And next time I'll go into a problem solving a ranking cycle. Have a good one. Bye-bye.